Good afternoon, uh, good morning to everyone. We're seeing uh, folks coming into the room. Uh, we're 20, 20, 22, 25, 30. Um, thanks for everyone for waiting patiently in the, in the room. We're gonna take a couple minutes uh, before we start our presentation, um, but I wanted to give everyone a sense of uh, the format and what to expect. Um, we've asked uh, Professor Lancelotti to come and give a short presentation. Uh, then I'm gonna ask some of the pressing questions that I've had uh, for the last few months after reading uh, his latest book of translation. And, and then we'll open it to questions for all of you. Topping 50. Um, so as far as questions, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a button says Q&A. Um, you can submit your questions there uh, at any time. So as, we're, as you're listening, if you have a question, submit it. Uh, I'll be reviewing it and then picking uh, the best questions uh, to ask at, at about the halfway point. Um, but um, 54, uh, I'll give you about 30 more seconds for the rest of the stragglers to come in and I think we'll start seeing people in the first five minutes come into the room. Uh, so to get started, uh, I wanted to introduce our guest, Carlo Lancelotti. Uh, he's a professor of uh, math uh, and a member of the graduate faculty in physics at the City University of New York uh, in Staten Island. And uh, in addition to his work in, in, in math and physics, um, he has translated a, a work of uh, uh, Italian philosophy and political thinking um, called The Crisis of Modernity, which I have here uh, by uh, Augusto del Noce. And um, I'm so excited to speak with him because this book is a collection of kind of excerpts uh, of, of essays uh, from del Noce uh, that span over really his whole career and includes a, some very insightful interviews with him, personal interviews at the end, which I found uh, equally uh, fascinating. And uh, I, I would say to all of you, uh, I, I recommend the book. And uh, I, I would say that this is really without doubt, probably the best book and most important book I read this year. And uh, even though I'm actually a, a, an Italian speaker, um, I think that this would have been very challenging to read in, a, in the original language for me. Uh, and I'm so grateful that uh, the professor has made this book available to everyone in the English speaking world. Uh, and I've, I've asked uh, the professor to, to do something very ambitious. I've asked him to um, provide some of the kind of key uh, ideas from the book, uh, from the crisis of modernity, uh, and then also relate them to the current unrest that you're seeing, uh, the current moment of what you might call uh, neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism, uh, and uh, to contextualize some of the recent unrest uh, within the framework that Del Noche offers. Uh, so, Without further ado, uh, again, if you're just coming in, we looks like we topped 60. Um, uh, the professor is going to speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, then I'm going to ask some questions that have been uh, on my mind since uh, reading his book of translation. And then uh, we'll take questions from the audience, uh, which you can submit in the Q&A tab. So uh, professor, welcome. Thank you so much for thank coming. You. And uh, uh, we, we all are anxiously awaiting to hear from you. Oh, thank you, Christopher. It's a pleasure to be here. So Del Noche. Del Noche was probably the most important, one of the five or six most important Italian uh, political philosophers in the second half of the 20th century. And uh, he was certainly also the most important Catholic one because his, his thought was kind of informed by you know, classical thought, Aquinas and Plato and Rosmini. Uh, at the time where most of the Italian philosophical culture was Marxist. And, gen and more generally, Del Noce's career was uh, shaped by po politics in some sense, because as a young man, he became an adult under fascism. He was born in 1910. So his first question was how to respond to fascism. And in his university years, he became an anti-fascist. Uh, but then uh, there was a big shift with the Second World War when a lot of the Italian uh, culture war shifted in the direction of Marxism. So those were the years uh, Gramsci had died in 1937, and a lot of people, including fascists and Catholics, uh, responded to the tragedies of the 20th century by embracing Marxism. So after 1945, Marxist became very hegemonic in Italian culture, in the universities, in foundations. In the, 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 the Communist Party was the second largest party. And in 1948, uh, it came very close to winning the elections. 
And in a sense, Italy could have been the only country in the world where communists would go to power democratically, because as you know, in Eastern Europe, uh, communist regimes were installed by essentially the Soviet Union after the Yalta division of Europe. But in Italy, communism was really strong at the cultural level, and uh, it almost came close to winning the election. And then, in some sense, the, the political system was blocked for uh, 25, 30 years because uh, Italy was part of NATO, and so there was, but the, the second largest party was communist. So anyway, uh, to make a long so story short, then the big question for intellectuals was how to deal with Marx, how to answer to Marx. And so in, the notion went from one totalitarianism to another, from fascist to Marxist. And then in his life, there was a third major, another major, a second major shift in the 60s, where there was this paradoxical situation in which Marxism was hegemonic in the culture, but at the same time, the, what, what he calls the affluent society took off. Affluent society is a, was a book by an American, John Kenneth Galbraith, but to the notion that had a deep philosophical significance. It meant that uh, uh, the culture uh, responded, the, the West responded to communism, what he says, on the ground of a greater secularity, not by trying to oppose, like, a, say, a Christian worldview to a Marxist worldview, but by pumping up well being, pumping up you know, rich, um, wealth, you know, uh, lifestyle. And, and, and so that there was this society, there was this economic, uh, great economic expansion after the war. And the culture embraced uh, this kind of a, a more materialistic, more secular worldview. There was the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution was also part of this kind of response to communism, if you wish, in a sense. In the sense that we are more free, we are richer, the West is going to win on, uh, against the Soviet Union on the ground of uh, being sexually free, of being wealthy, of being technological advanced. There was a big uh, embrace of science and technology not just uh, in practice, but also culturally. The culture in the 50s and 60s really embraced very much science and technology and sexual freedom as a response to the totalitarian movements of the 20th century. And the Noche had to understand what this meant. And he came to see that even this shift to uh, science, technology, sexual freedom, in some sense was part of the same totalitarian kind of worldview that had been developing in, in the West. I mean, so it was counterculture because everybody thought that, you know, that the, the affluent society, the West was uh, completely anti-Marxist, but the not just um, notice that there were some similarities, like the, the prevalence of the economic factor, the, the idea that, you know, knowledge is instrumental, the fact that, you know, that, uh, that really religion is secondary to society, that society can come together on some sort of scientific agnosticism. There were all these ideas that were challenging, he was trying to understand. So his, his work, his, his life work was to, to try to understand the development of politics and culture from a philosophical perspective, and especially these, these two big shifts from fascists to communists, and from communists to the affluent society. This is the subject of most of his books, really. He was not an academic, I mean, he was a philosophy professor, but his books are not uh, about uh, timeless metaphysics. They're about really political philosophy, and especially trying to understand what ideas have been driving contemporary history. That was his big thing, to try to understand history in the lens of philosophy, also because one characteristic of this kind of new culture after the Second World War was the idea that, that uh, ideas follow economics, ideas follow sociology, ideas follow material conditions, you know. And this was common also in the, in the, in the West. I mean, if you think of in, in America in the 50s, it was the golden age of sociology. I mean, there is a book by an evangelical scholar, George Marston, called The, the Twilight of the American Enlightenment, in which he does a, an interesting review of American culture in the 50s. And he shows that American culture in the 50s, there was this, again, this sense of that what we can rely on is science, and that science can also explain society. It was also the golden age of psychology, right? Psychology as a substitute uh, religion in the 50s was 
pretty common. And so um, you see that already in this idea that material forces and that uh, uh, sociology and economics drive ideas, there is a whiff of Marxism in a sense. You know, the, the idea that ideas are a superstructure, that, 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 that what people and, and religion and philosophy are kind of consequences that they can be explained sociologically, economically, psychologically, or with the human sciences, anthropologically, you know, whatever. You can see that already there was some something there that had the Marxist aspect in a new sense. In, 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 what kind of made the Noce kind of famous, at least in Italy, is that he kind of was kind of prophetic in some of his uh, insights. And for example, he early on he prophesized that, uh, that, that the communists would uh, collapse at, at the time when it was very hegemonic. And, and so he prophesied that really the affluent society would win. The Western affluent society would prevail over Marxism as it did. And, you know, I mean, the, 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 and, and he, he, he had this knack for reading the culture in terms of general philosophical ideas and then extrapolating, trying to understand, okay, then if you develop this logically, where is this going to go? I mean, I remember the reason I kind of got uh, into, I decided to, to translate uh, some of his books was because back in, I don't know, 2008, 2009, I was in my father's house in Italy and it, he had this book by the notion. And I opened this essay in 1970, from 1970, which he states, well, the sexual revolution is about this, is about that. So there is nothing to be surprised about the idea, of, for instance, of homosexual marriages. That was at the time of the debate on, on same-sex marriage in this country. But he wrote that in 1970, so I was like, that's interesting. You know, why, uh, why in 1970 he had this idea that, for example, same-sex marriages was, in a sense, inevitable. And again, it was because he was very perceptive of the deep ideas that people were kind of following. And, he, and from there, he went on and kind of had a, had a, had a, had a gift for uh, drawing the, the logical consequences, so to speak. The other thing I thought, is, I thought it was worth translating him is because uh, there is a certain difference in which the, the, the secularization played out in the United States as opposed to Europe. In Europe, Marxists played a major role from the beginning. I mean, the, the, Already in the 50s and 60s, the Marxist was very strong in European culture, and uh, it was part of the process of self secularization. Uh, but in America, because of the Cold War and because of the different culture, uh, in a sense, it was always a foreign reality. I mean, it, it was communist, it was in the Soviet Union, it was something certainly uh, foreign. You know, there, there, there were, Certainly, the American left was not Marxist in the 50s or 60s. It was more based on trade unions and uh, the tra other traditional forms of class interest. And, and then, in some sense, what I noticed that in the 90s and the 2000s, when I moved to the US to work, um, in some sense, Europe came to America. Now, this is a very delicate thing to discuss because it can be easily misunderstood. But in, in some sense, it, uh, the United States in the early 20th century did not experience totalitarianism, or more generally, they did not experience ideological thinking the way uh, the way Europe did. It's more recent. I mean, that this, this, uh, these ideologies, uh, what I would call the ideological way of thinking, kind of took off in this country after the 70s. Uh, and and, and the, it really became influential politically in, in the 90s, I would say. And, and I would say that people were kind of unprepared for it. I mean, it was a new thing. It was a little bit new. While, and so for a European living in the States, you could see that people had a hard time understanding some ways of thinking that actually had already, in, in, a, in different forms, had already been more common back in Europe. And, and so even if, of course, the Noche is very Italian in some ways, and it's, uh, is foreign to the American milieu. Nevertheless, it's interesting that some of the discussions, uh, some of the things he observed back in the day against fascism, against communism, are sort of happening again in some ways in, in the United States. Although, again, we have to make some distinctions, but, but uh, I guess we're going to talk about that. So, 
so that was kind of motivated me. I, I had this impression that the notch had something to contribute because he, he brought a voice from the European 20th century uh, to describe certain phenomena that were coming later in the United States. Does that help? Yeah, and, and I think one thing as well is in the American context, I, my sense, and I'd love to hear your perspective, is that for Americans, it was we felt like the Cold War was won. Uh, communi international communism had been kind of revealed as catastrophic economically, catastrophic culturally, and uh, having left a high body count in the 20th century, and that especially people on the American right or even the kind of liberal left had let their guard down. What do you think accounts for the resurgence of these ideas? And, and in, a, in a sense, the kind of ideological power um, that ha has emerged since the 1990s, even in the greater historical context of the failure of kind of international communism or international socialism. Right, you know, I, I think it is helpful to distinguish communism as the specific political movement that started in Russia in 1917 with Lenin and then Stalin and from Marxism in a broader philosophical sense. Because in, in a narrow political sense, I think it's true, communism is over. I mean, I, I don't expect a Leninist revolution anytime soon, anywhere, even in, in the US. But, but you know, what the Notch's interest was to understand the notion thought that Marx, sorry, yeah, that Marx was a real philosopher, okay? because because very often people uh, try to kind of um, dismiss Marx as a philosopher, and they think that you know he was a political analyst, a, a social analyst, like the theory of you know, the evolution of capitalism, and the relation between the bourgeois and the proletariat then the way the revolution would come about, the society without classes, let's say all the stuff you read in the capital, you know, the, the later Marx. But the notion thought that the later Marx was whatever it was, but the, 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 the Marx was first of all a philosopher as can be seen in his uh, early works, in, in the works of his youth, like the, the manuscripts of 1844 or the German ideology. And he thought that Marx's thought as a broader significance than communism, right? So I, I would make this distinction. The, the marks that the knowledge is interested in is marks the philosopher of which communism is one possible expression, uh, but not the only possible one. And he also uh, thought that you have to understand how Marx was interpreted in Western Europe after World War II. So the, the, there are these two different aspects. Marx is a philosopher and then the evolution of Marxism after World War II. I don't know if I should go there. You want me, you want me to try to... Yeah, I, I, I think, yes. And, and I think that, can you maybe talk a bit about how the kind of class-based Marxism, economic-based Marxism uh, has fallen away and maybe talk about the emergence um, through yes. the kind of culturally-based, identity-based, um, because that's really, you know, it, it, it almost seems like in the United States, the activists and kind of the left is less interested in economic transformation and, and fully committed to cultural transformation, which Absolutely. seems to be a, almost kind of, there's almost no barricade uh, that will stop them. And so maybe talk about the historical underpinnings of that shift uh, in the kind of greater Marxist framework. Okay, let's put it this way. First of all, to Del Noche, Marxism, is uh, the first attempt at the systematic form of political atheism, right? Uh, because the, if you read Marx's uh, youthful work, what he really started them was this idea that uh, man must be independent. The idea that to be free is to be independent. We must not depend on God. And that God has been just invented as a, as a, as a fiction to cover up our slavery, exploitation, economic oppression. But so that ultimately in order to eliminate exploitation at the root, you have to eliminate the very idea of God, the very idea of being created, okay? So the first philosophical concept of this is that uh, man must be the creator. Man must create himself, right? Because if somebody else creates you, you are, uh, dependent on your creator, right? So that may sound abstract, but it, it, 
it has an immediate consequence. The immediate consequence is that philosophy must be replaced by politics. Right? If I create myself, if humanity has to create itself and not depend on God, the way to do this is through work. And the most noble form of work is political work because politics is the way we make ourselves independent. We create ourselves. So uh, to, 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 to the notion that the, the, the very starting point of, of Marx is this idea that politics is everything, total politicization, which is something you can see today. And, and, and to him, the, in a sense, this total extension of politics to replace religion. Okay? The, 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 the crucial Marxist idea is in a sense that politics replaces religion to free us. Okay? We, will, we, will, we cannot be freed by the grace of God. We will be free through political action. Okay? So politics becomes religion. This is, this is the notion interpretation of the young Marx. Now, uh, if we go from this idea that politics must uh, free us uh, and that politics becomes the new religion, you can see that whether the proletariat is the class that brings about liberation or not, it's kind of accidental, it's kind of secondary. Okay? In, in the 19th century, Marx thought that it would be the proletariat, but you can replace the proletariat with something else. I mean, the, the key idea is not so much the proletarian against the bourgeoisie, which is more of a so sociological analysis. The key idea is this idea of liberation through politics, of politics as religion, the absolutization of politics. Which is also the root of totalitarianism, you know, because why did, in a sense, Marx lead to totalitarian systems? I mean, the, the, the one way to describe totalitarian is not just that you have concentration camps and the secret police and, and, and you whatever. The basic idea of totalitarian is that politics is absolute, that, 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 that there is no sphere of society which is not controlled by politics, that everything must be liberated, everything must be invaded by my creative political work. You know, think of Lenin, and you can see that also in, in Dostoevsky, if you read the possess, you know, there is this idea that are being possessed by politics, because politics is, is, the, is the substitute for religion. Okay? So this is the, the, the general idea. Now, to understand what you asked about the shift to more identity-based, not class-based Marxism, um, you have to um, realize that um, according to Del Noce, in Marxism there is a deep contradiction. Because in order, to, um, in order to bring about the heaven on earth, in order to create this complete liberation, one has to destroy something. You have to destroy all the, all the oppressive structures. Okay? You have to destroy uh, the family, you have to destroy the church, you have to destroy the state, you have to destroy all the things that are the instruments of um, whatever exploitation or, or slavery. And the way this happens in Marx is, according to the Noce, is through this uh, doctrine called historical materialism. Historical materialism simply means that uh, all ideas, moral values, uh, religions are unmasked, are shown to be fraud by showing that they're just covered for economic forces. Like, 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 like just, just by showing that every, moral values are all uh, false because they are just produced by the people in power to oppress the people not in power. Okay? The, the world is divided because the oppressor and the oppressed. People in power, people not in power. And the way people in power oppress the other people is by inventing religion, by inventing bourgeois morality, by inventing liberal education. Okay? All, all these things are interpreted as expressions of social economic forces. And there is this, and you know, this is in America today, it's phrased in terms of being a construct. This is a social, have you heard that before? This is a social construct, right? So because it's a social construct, we have to deconstruct it. We have to demolish it. And then we will be freer from this construct, which is used as a tool of domination. Okay, so that's one side of Marx. The, 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 the deconstructive side, the side that unmasks all this uh, uh, covers for social economic powers. But then there is the other side of Marx. The other side of Marx is the revolutionary side. The revolutionary side is this kind of religious faith that if we destroy everything, then there will be a new world, right? There is this kind of romantic 19th century idea that the revolution will usher in a new world, that, 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 we'll, that we, we will destroy the powerful, we'll destroy everything, and then there will be freedom, there will be a new world. 
and this is really a religious faith. It's utopian. It does not have any, there is no reason why after the revolution people should be better than before the revolution, right? So you see these two aspects, the materialistic, sociological aspect, and the revolutionary, romantic, utopian aspect. The big idea that the Noja had, interrupt me if I'm going to run, but let me finish this too long. This, the, these two things are contradictory, okay? At the end of the day, the Marxist critique must apply to Marxism itself. If everything is an expression of social forces, also Marxism must be an expression of social forces. And in the long run, even the revolution must be unmasked. Right, even the, this romantic dream of the revolution of the world without classes of the reign of freedom is contradictory with the destructive part, with the historical materialistic critique. So at the end of the day, Marx is, the, the, the destructive aspect of Marx is as to devour, as to corrode the revolutionary positive utopian aspect of Marx. And to the notion, this is what happened. And now this is to answer, I'm almost done to answer your question. What happened is that communists failed as a revolution, but succeeded as sociology, they su succeeded as materialism, right? They su succeeded uh, in this critical, uh, destructive analysis of religion, of education, of the family, of the state. That went on and took a life of its own. And to the notion, since already the 60s, the West was already very much under this way of this sociological critique sociological critique of religion, of the family, uh, uh, without the revolutionary aspect. So to him, it's like the West picked one side of Marxism, I'm talking the West in the sense of the technocratic, affluent, secular, uh, bourgeois West, kind of accepted this kind of nihilistic, relativistic side of Marxism and rejected the revolution. Then the revolution can take a life of its own, but it becomes completely random. It becomes completely irrational. Maybe before we go there, tell me if this is helpful. It is, and I think you know I'd offer some perspective on this. And and uh, in the American context, I, I just finished a film for PBS uh, that should be broadcasting later this year, looking at uh, neighborhoods in America's poorest cities, and living and working in cities like Seattle and San Francisco and LA. And then having spent time in these kind of second and third tier cities with high rates of poverty and social pathology, it almost seems that the kind of the what you're talking about the kind of sociological revolution that is being practiced and and preached really by American elite culture, um, where they can say we have our kind of high growth tech companies, uh, but at the same time we can preach the kind of liberatory, uh, you know, kind of bourgeois liberatory practice of sexual revolution, et cetera. Whereas the, the consequence and the irony is that in these poor communities, you have places that the, the old kind of traditional culture has been destroyed. The churches are literally empty and abandoned. And then in many cases, in many neighborhoods, again, across racial groups, white, Latino, black, uh, Native American even, you have maybe 70% rate of, of single family homes. So the, even the base kind of protection of the family has been obliterated. And it seems like in this kind of paradoxical inversion, the victory of Marxism has buffered kind of economic elites and destroyed the old proletariat. And I, I find that to be the most tragic and, and really horrific expression in the United States. And where do you see that going? What is the logical endpoint of that, that kind of uh, social process? Well, I mean, the Nutcher described the Western society based on sociology and technocracy and scientism as the most conservative in the history of the world. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a society, but conservative in a bad sense. I mean, I mean, conservative in the sense that it tends to preserve its privileges. It tends to preserve the economic status quo. Um, now, uh, as a matter of fact, as you described very well, uh, it, it corresponds to uh, a deep destruction of what sustains society. So. The result is a bifurcation of society, so to speak. Bifurcation means something that divides in two parts because the elite and the masses don't have anything left in common, right? I mean, in, 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 if you think of it, the, the, the biggest requirement to run a country is that the people in power must somehow, the people in the elite must somehow share the ideals. They must communicate some ideas in common with the, the grassroots, with the masses, right? That could be religion, or it could be 
epic poetry, it could be national literature, but in some sense to have a functional, a functional society, you need some kind of ideal communication between the top and the bottom, right? In, in, in some sense, there must be some shared ideal. Now we are in a situation that because the top has embraced this kind of technocratic, secular, scientific worldview, it has nothing in common with the grassroots. It cannot communicate to the grassroots. So all it can say that to the grassroots is that you have to become bourgeois like us. I mean, I mean that's, that, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's, that's the plan, right? The only possible plan is for everybody to become this kind of globalized, bourgeois, sexually liberated, affluent individual. Individual which is kind of at atomic because it is not united to other individuals by a common ideal, by a common religious faith, by a common even nationality, right? It's so much so that this new elite is very global. You know, if you take a, a somebody from some kind of rich uh, uh, person from Seattle who, uh, who eats the best food, uh, he loves to go to Milan or he loves to go to London because it's this kind of, you know, the same passion for good food, for a certain fine taste, and uh, a certain kind of jobs in finance, in, in the arts, you know, the so-called in the service economy. Like, it's kind of like this international galaxy of people, but the guy in Seattle, in, in this kind of social group, feels much more closer to the same guy in Milan than to somebody in Olympia or whatever you have in, you know, in Washington. I mean, if you go to, to a working class part or, or, or whatever, it's much closer culturally. I, I, you know, I, I had some experience that 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 you described very eloquently. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, Italian father, going to Italy in the summers, going to our small village, two thousand people, and then I, I went, took my family, my immediate family now, to Florence, uh, uh, Italy, on kind of a vacation uh, two years ago, and I was horrified. In this kind of beautiful streets of Florence, you go into any kind of nightclub or coffee shop or cafe, and once you enter that, you see the kind of architecture fades away. I'm looking around the design, the decor, the culture, the food, everything is identical to what I could get in Seattle or New York or Bangkok or London. And it seems like the, the cultural right. tradition has been really kind of erased from many of these places. And yes. that brings me to my next question. And I have two more questions before we take com questions from the audience. But Del Noche makes, a, I think, a very eloquent and persuasive argument in defense of tradition. And he argues, as I'll summarize, and correct me if I'm wrong, that tradition is not about maintaining a status quo. It's not about uh, defending uh, you know, everything as it is now, but it's about handing down, uh, kind of passing down the best parts of a culture that, can, that are functional and, and, and meaningful and preserving that. Can you outline uh, kind of the, the, what is this defense of tradition and how can it apply to today? where it seems like the tradition is really under attack on all sides. I mean, he says that tradition means that you hand down what has permanent value. I mean, there are some things that you hand them down because you know they're going to be permanent. Uh, so, for example, say that you discover, uh, you discover that uh, love means uh, self-gift. I don't know, that's a typical, it doesn't just mean kind of either sentimental, emotional satisfaction, but it involves a self-gift. And so for example, love, uh, marriage, in a sense, if it is true marriage is not based on love, but it is based on this self-gift that cannot be recalled. I mean, I'm, I'm just making this up, okay? It's so that you discover certain things about love and sexuality, that you see that they correspond to an eternal human reality, to an eternal human structure. Then you teach them to your children, but you don't teach them to your children because they come from the past. That's not tradition. Tradition is not what comes from the past. Tradition is what is, in some sense, eternally valid. Eternally valid because it corresponds to a deep human experience that you discover and so you can transmit. Okay, so that, that's his point. That the tradition has to do, again, with the discovery of ideal values that have a permanent validity. But if, uh, really, uh, in, in, a, in a more, let's call it, bourgeois worldview, we, there is no such thing. Everything is determined socially, economically. The economic conditions change, the social conditions change, sexual, sexual values will change, you know, and there is nothing permanent. There is nothing permanent because everything is kind of predicated on the material situation. Then the old notion of tradition loses 
it's mean. There is nothing to communicate. And I'll, I think that is, feeds right into the question. A number of the questions uh, from the audience, um, they're wanting to understand better how these kind of, uh, kind of repackaged or, or kind of uh, rethought ideas based in Marxism uh, changed uh, from the kind of cultural campaigns of the 60s. What is the mechanism of transmission? Are they asking, uh, you know, an anonymous attendee asks, what vehicles or avenues exist uh, that transmit this kind of indoctrination in their word, and then what could interrupt uh, in interrupt it? Well, the notion is interesting in that way because he, he thinks that the, the typical way our society transmits these ideas is by an interpretation of contemporary history. Because, you know, in, in, in our culture, really, people don't teach you philosophy in high school. There is not a lot of emphasis on, on making these ideas explicit. Usually these kind of ideas are not communicated explicitly, but they are communicated implicitly through uh, uh, what he calls myth, myths, like a myth. Like for example, uh, the idea of progress, eh? the idea that uh, everybody until 1962 was sexually repressed, and then we discover sex or, or something like that. Or the idea that the, and the, the fascist was authoritarian. The definition of fascist, that fascist was uh, an, an authoritarian movement, and then to be anti-fascist, to be anti-authoritarian, and then there is this opposition of the fascist against the anti-fascist. Okay, this kind of historical, mythical narrative is typically the way this is communicated. And, and, and it, it, you can find it in Hollywood movies, or you can find it in video games, okay? Typically, it says that it's usually communicated in the, today, the, the way our society communicates its ideas is indirectly through historical narrative. Yeah, one could go on and on to explain what that means, but that will be his short answer. And uh, the next question from Kevin, I think uh, it, it kind of a question of what are the stakes? Uh, and he asks, without you know, the Kremlin or the common turn to drive international communism, uh, does the new kind of identity-based Marxism really pose the same threat as it did in the 1920s and 1930s and how? Yes, I want to, to stress again that what, what the Noche would diagnose today is this split Marxism. A split in the sense that there is the relativistic, sociological, materialistic aspect, which is very conservative. I mean, it's like the big, you know, Google, Amazon, they, they all embrace this kind of sociology, moral relativism. They're, they're all, there is no problem with that. And then there is the people who, say in academia or in the streets of Seattle, dream of a revolution. But this dream of the revolution never comes to real political fruition, I don't think, because so much so it's not a threat, right? I mean, uh, big American corporations are not worried about the re revolution right now. And, you know, Marxism is not, uh, is not producing communism anymore. It's not producing um, revolutionaries that are believers in the direction of history. Because, you know, the old Marxists, they had these two things together. They had the destructive aspect, but they also had this faith that history was going toward uh, heaven on earth, right? That history was moving in a certain direction. Today is no longer the case. Even the people who want to be, um, to be revolutionaries are kind of irrational. They don't have a theory of history. They don't believe in the, the fact that the logic of capitalism will inevitably bring about communism on earth. They don't believe that. So the two aspects of Marxism are split, are divided, okay? And the, 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 the relativistic historical, historical materialistic aspect is well established. I mean, it, it is in the educational system. It is in, it, it has been the kind of implicit ideology of the American elite and Western elite in general for decades. You, 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 could, you, could, you could argue that uh, it was already popular in the 60s in, in, in some sense. Now, the question is now there is all these revolutionary ferments. You know, there are people in the street. I don't think they pose a threat to the system personally because they, what I said before, they're kind of irrationalistic. They don't, even, they don't have a theory. They don't, have, they don't want to put an end to capital. Their enemies are somewhat imaginary, right? I mean, okay, the, where are the fascists? You got, you know, I have a friend who lives in Portland. There's the anti-fascist. Where are the fascists? I mean, okay, okay you, you, can, you can think that uh, Trump is a fascist. I'm not going to go there. But, but in reality, these movements are very irrational, and they are kind of fighting ghosts, right? 
the, the funny thing is that when when you when you separate uh, the, the revolutionary impulse from the Marxist theory of history, what's left is fascism. Okay, I mean I, I don't want to say that the anti-fascists are fascists because that would not, that would be unkind to them. They would be very offended. But but the nature of fascism in Italy was precisely, you know, Mussolini was a was a socialist. Mussolini was a revolutionary socialist. And when he became a fascist, he kind of stepped away from the Marxist theory of society, the Marxist theory that uh, capitalism and the, would end and bring communism, and became an activist. You know, when you have this kind of the, the activist side of Marxist separated from the Marxist theory of history, what you get is more or less what Mussolini did, a, a revolutionary activism without the theory. And so I, I don't expect it to be very dangerous. What is more dangerous is, uh, you know, the the, uh, the totalitarian aspect in the elite. The elite is not out in the street. The, the elite is the academic elite, the journalistic elite, some political elite. Uh, they still have this kind of destructive sociological nihilistic uh, ideas that correspond in some sense to one side of Marxism, the relativist side of Marxism. And it's probably getting worse, but it's been going on for a while. So I, I, it's not clear what's going to happen. Yeah, I think, you know, one person who has documented the lineage of that is Christopher Lash, who I, I wish was still with us. And his books, uh, much like Del Noche, when you read them today, it feels like someone is speaking to you from, not from the past, but from the future. And yeah. I guess what, what I didn't see in um, The Crisis of Modernity and everyone, again, uh, this is the book. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's it's not an easy read. Um, it, it's something you really have to kind of uh, think, uh, think through. But I, I think it kind of unveils a deeper channel of what's happening today. But one thing I didn't see, and perhaps this is in uh, part of Del Noche's work that that is not included in the book, but it seems like his diagnosis uh, is, in my view, correct. Uh, but I, I felt like what I was waiting for was a kind of path forward, how to reestablish the kind of tradition, how to reestablish <laughs> metaphysics, how to reestablish the foundation and basis for a society uh, that could then be kind of regrown. Uh, and and it, it, it feels like we're heading, accelerating towards that kind of libertarian and revolutionary kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, kind of, a path forward that leads to nihilism. Is there any hope, either in Del Noche directly or or in you, as kind of the your own thoughts, uh, to how to reestablish a different foundation or a different basis? I would say two things. One is that politics alone is not enough, because precisely because the nature of of this movement is to politicize everything. Uh, just to re reduce it to a political fight. I mean, politics is necessary, but politics by itself does not address the deeper level of ideas. Now, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, Del Noche thinks that Marxism was just symbolic of the first attempt at, at some kind of political atheism. And I, and I would argue that a lot of these current movements, even if sometimes they're not even aware of it, uh, this dynamic, can also happen without any, without reading Marx. You don't need to read Marx to be a Marxist in the sense that if you follow logically the trajectory of political atheism and that you need to be independent, you need to be the creator of your own life, you need to be the creator of the world, you follow logically the step, you end up with this kind of absolutization of politics, you end up with all these ideological myths about, uh, uh, I'm not going there, so the response to a, it's, it's a religious crisis. I mean, the Noche thought that this was essentially a religious crisis because uh, at the end of the day, it's a manifestation of a particularly aggressive form of atheism that expresses itself politically. If that's true, I mean, that's open to discussion, but if that's the case, then Noche says somewhere that he thought that anyway, it's not that philosophers or politicians can fix a religious crisis. It, it requires a rediscover of the deeper human questions and of possible answers. You know, it, it requires in some sense a religious renaissance, it, 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 not just in the sense of worship, in the sense of going to church, but in the deeper sense of rediscovering 
that to be human uh, is not exhausted by politics, is not exhausted by sociology, that to be human poses deep questions, and that to be human uh, and to live in society, you cannot have a society without, in some sense, looking at the deeper religious questions. I mean, it, that's kind of the modern Western assumption that, so, that, that religion can be put on the side and we can organize society rationally and scientifically. But at the end of the day, you, any society lives according to some conjecture, some hypothesis, some vision of what it means to be a human being. And that kind of question, in some sense, has to be re-explored. I know that's vague and not very satisfactory, but that's what Del Noche would say. No, I, I don't think it's vague, and I think it's, it, it, it is, I guess the question, and, I, and I, again, I didn't see this explicitly in the, in the book, but is the question, um, is kind of the reimagining of God, the reestablishing of God in human life, uh, is it, Kind of philosophically and historically possible. Uh, does 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 Del Noche, you know, fundamentally believe that it's possible, or does he fundamentally believe that yeah. we're at a point in history where that has been exhausted? Del Noche believes it's possible, but it believes that the definition of modernity is that modernity is the idea that it is no longer possible. <laughs> if you read the if you read the if you read the the first essay in the book, it's called the idea of modernity. And he says that all of modernity, in his opinion, is predicated on this sentence. It is no longer possible. And then he says, what is no longer possible? What is no longer possible is transcendence, he says. He says transcendence in the sense of saying that human beings don't just belong to the powers that be of sociology, society, and economics, and, and whatever, but hum, human beings by nature have access to the truth, to justice, to, to beauty. The human beings have access to, in one word, transcendence, you know, and, and, and that this is the foundation of social life, to share this search and to find ways to, to, to come together around this question. So the not think it's possible, but I think that, that, what, that we have to break through this kind of uh, fiction, this kind of historical narrative that is no longer possible. Yeah, I wonder, you know, and I've seen this in my own experience and observing with other people uh, around me, even friends and, and acquaintances, that um, when you live the kind of maybe uh, libertine or kind of uh, revolutionary life, uh, there comes a point of crisis of nihilism, where you kind of, your feet hit the ground and you realize that there's nothing there. And I've seen people's lives... Uh, you know, both in my journalistic work and also just in my own uh, immediate kind of life, uh, where people hit that point of kind of kind of nihilistic bottom, and they realize yeah. there's something above. And uh, I I've seen it in the kind of individual transformations. I worked with people who are gang members, drug addicted, abandoned their families, and then they hit a point where they're, you know, in one example, sitting on the floor of solitary confinement in San Quentin, and they have a religious experience. And at that point, their life changes. And I guess the, the question is, can that individual experience um, kind of replicate itself to the point where it becomes a social experience? Um, and, uh, and that, I guess, is the hope, right? That is the breaking out of the, the kind of crisis of modernity into something that, that subsumes the modern questions of modernity but elevates it to the point of transcendence. Yes, I think you put it very well. I mean, the, 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 the thing is that, you know, people are miserable out there. I mean, if you, if you look at the numbers on mental health, we are in an amazing mental health crisis in, in, in the West, and, and especially in this country. People are unhappy. The only thing is that, in some sense, you know, uh, the Noche was also a critic of uh, some trends in the churches, especially in Catholicism, being Catholic. And he said, somebody has to offer an alternative. You know? Somebody has to offer an alternative. And sometimes uh, this myth of modernity uh, has also affected the people who should offer something better, right? I mean, sometimes you, know, you, you get uh, Christians or, that are so, in a sense, wrapped up in this myth that we have to deal with modernity. We have to find a way to respond to modernity, to conform to modernity, to deal with modernity. They, they don't offer what people are really looking for because people are looking for beauty, for truth. Uh, people are in need. 
and uh, and sometimes uh, with these ideological myths like progress modernity if, uh, 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 people buy into them and they don't do their job if people are offered something better i think that many may take it you know i mean yes. and i you know i in our few minutes here i'm going to take more quite a couple more questions but i wanted to ask you even on a personal level i think that the ideas you're talking about are uh, at one time solid, they're rooted, they're grounded. I, I know for everyone in the audience, uh, you know, would, would, would resonate and make sense, but they're also kind of, in some sense, taboo or forbidden by the culture. Um, mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? And have you um, kind of personally come across anyone who is kind of resisting uh, the, the work that you're doing? And, um, and yeah, and no, what it's do you interesting. Make of that? It's very interesting. Today, I was reading, uh, to prepare, I was reading one of the Noja's books that is not available in English, but it goes on and on about what says forbidden questions. So as you just said, some of these questions are forbidden because, you know, uh, this, let's say, let's put a political atheism to justify itself must remove the question of God, the question of meaning, right? And, 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 and so people are starving for meaning, but the question of meaning is almost pornographic in some sense. You know, you, 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 it's easier to talk about uh, almost anything than to talk about questions of meaning. It's considered kind of embarrassing, an invasion of privacy or, or, or something. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. And, and that's why the Noja thought that this dynamic is, a, again, a totalitarian aspect because, because some things we are not supposed to talk about. But having said that, deep down, everybody has those questions. Everybody has a need for meaning. Even the people who go downtown and burn the police department, uh, yeah, they may have some crazy ideas, but they're really trying to get something interesting to do in life. You know, I mean, I, my friend in Potan was telling me that when he lives near downtown Potan, he says that these uh, protests are the most boring thing until the police shows up. And everybody's kind of praying, not praying, but at least hoping that the police shows up because then <laughs> At least there is an enemy, there is some meaning, there is something, you know, there is some interest. Uh, the only thing is that that's, a, that's an incorrect expression of, the, of desire. We have, people have that desire. So, so uh, I, I, I would say that uh, we should bet, we should gamble on that desire. That people have a desire for meaning, have a desire for beauty. In some sense, in that sense, too much political confrontation can be a distraction. I, mm. if, we, if, if one gets too wrapped up in the political fight, as correct as it may be, that should not be a distraction from the fact that people have that desire for beauty, for justice, for friendship, for all these transcendent realities. And that the first responsibility is to address that, I think. Mm. I think a great sentence uh, in the book that has really just kind of stuck with me is that uh, Del Noche describes um, kind of Marxism and the revolution as absorbing ethics into politics. And maybe mm. what I'm hearing from you now is that the work is not necessarily, if you fight on that terrain, you're already losing uh, because exactly. the, the epistemology of that terrain is a losing battle. Whereas maybe the deeper question is how to reestablish the grounds of ethics and then invite kind of the opposition to fight on our terrain uh, where they will be Man. kind of inevitably lose. Yes, amen, you know, not just of ethics, but yeah. Ethics is grounded on the experience of beauty, for example, on the experience of, you know, of, because if people have a desire for, for instance, we shouldn't be afraid if people express a desire for justice. That's a human thing that can go straight to God in some sense. The problem is that when the desire for justice is co-opted and exploited ideologically by the powers that be, that's the real problem. Uh, but I agree. Hmm. And then, um, uh, like one question from David, he says, uh, quoting Solzhenitsyn, he says, uh, in the communist world, uh, 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 practitioners of the exact sciences must stand in for their annihilated brethren in the humanities. Uh, is this true among U.S. academics? And I think you're uniquely situated because you are a, a, a mathematician and, 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 uh, and, a, and, a, and a professor of physics, and yet you have a kind of deep sensitivity for the humanities and these larger human questions. Uh, yeah. what, what do you make of that, uh, that formulation from Solzhenitsyn? Can you read it to me again? In the communist world, practitioners of the exact sciences must stand in for their annihilated brethren in the humanities. Well, I mean, there is some truth. I don't want to dump on my colleagues in the humanities because you know a lot of people really who do the the, the 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 normal work week in week in week out. They're not 
these crazy ideologues that you read about. I mean, there are many people who just do their work trying to teach the kids to, to write or to <laughs> teach some history. I mean, that, that, thank goodness there is a lot of more normal people around them than, than, than one would think. Having said that, it's true that from a Marxist perspective, the, idea, the humanities are more vulnerable. Well, I mean, or at least the humanities and the sciences are vulnerable in different ways because, you know, the, the, when, when you have this kind of, um, let's call it philosophical Marxism, ideas are instrumental, okay? That, 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 that's what Denot just said about Marx, that, that ideas are not about knowing, are about changing. Okay? There is the 11th thesis on Feuerbach by Marx. Until now, philosophers have tried to comprehend the world when the point is to change it, okay? This should be written on some academic department where people think that the point of the university is not to understand the world, but to change it. Now, this can have bad consequences in the sciences. It becomes an excessive emphasis on application, for example. In the sciences, if you are fixated on changing the world, you're just going to be 100% about technological application and not about fundamental knowledge. So even in the sciences, this kind of instrumentalistic utilitarian attitude can do damage to the sciences because the sciences become short-sighted. They just go for the application and don't they stop asking fundamental questions. Well, you know, real scientific progress requires asking also fundamental questions that don't have any immediate application. Having said that, it's true. In the humanities, this instrumentalist utilitarian approach becomes politicization because how can, an, how can, the, how can a humanities professor change the world? Only through politics. Right? And so then you, you lose interest in knowing the humanities and you gain this disproportionate interest in applying the humanities. But the only application of the humanities, again, is political. And then that happens. So in that sense, it's true that humanities are more vulnerable. And do you see potential for the kind of final question? Do you see potential for uh, some kind of um, kind of stealing of themselves within academia? Do you feel like uh, among your kind of broadly across the, the United States, maybe in Europe, do you feel like there is a kind of academic contingent or faction that is willing to uh, stand up on some of these principles of ethics and metaphysics and, and tradition? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, there, there is different kinds of people. There is more traditional liberals, for example, who are not happy with this kind of ideological, more totalitarian drift. And then there is a ton of, as I said, there is many normal people. So we, we shouldn't exaggerate because there are some really glamorous crazy cases of people who are totally <laughs> ideological so uh, I'm, I'm not that pessimistic you know the the, the, the problem is that uh, with all the changes liberal arts are in a big crisis because with the economic crisis and everything else uh, and this kind of utilitarian approach the humanities are losing students left and right so the, the which could be, I don't know, it's, it's not good that there is no people learning literature and history and, and philosophy. On the other hand, it's true that there are some people teaching literature, history, and philosophy who, uh, we could do without some of them, but many people are doing their work, you know, so I, I wouldn't panic. I mean. Great. Well, you know, we're, we're nearing the end of the hour and uh, really want to thank you so much, uh, and not only for your time today, but for offering this uh, great service of translating the works of Del Noche. Uh, and I think uh, there are so many people that are uh, extremely grateful for what you've done and the meticulous care that you've put into uh, these books. And uh, I, I can't wait, uh, if you're able to share, is there anything else that you're working on in this vein that you could share with us publicly? Uh, I'm translating another book, the third, but. Um, the third is harder to read. So if you if you if you're interested in the Noche, read the one that Christopher proposed. That's the the the, the, the more accessible one. And be patient. Sometimes he's a bit of a European philosopher, you know. But yes, uh, yes, <laughs> something to say. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, anyone, if you have questions, you know, you, you can contact me. Uh, uh, happy to answer. Um, and uh, you know, on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you so much, Professor. And uh, we'll talk to you no, soon. Very well. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.